Now, I know, I know, Jimmy, you've got an unbelievable story yourself. In part one, you know, we talked about how you grew up, you know, uh, within, you know, within the mafia uh, circles. You know, your brother, um, you know, he knew all the, all, the, all the key mafia figures of the day. We're going to talk about them further on in this segment. You know, people like Sammy the Bull, Michael Frances, um, uh, Jimmy Burke, of course, who was pr uh, portrayed in Goodfellas. John Guys, the Guys, of course, all of these guys. We're going to go into that later. But I know you've got quite a story yourself to tell. So here's the question. Growing up in that environment in Queens with your brother, John A. Light, you know, he goes on to, to you know, serve a lot of time, do a lot of jail time, uh, be convicted of murders and uh, suspected of a lot more. You didn't go down that path. Why was that? uh jimmy what was the difference uh you know some luck right some luck sometimes a lot of things i did i just didn't get caught um i also think that um you know i saw god in my in, in a picture so you know there was a certain spiritual bent in me where i could only i knew certain things by by my own nature were wrong and we're against the laws of nature or the laws of God. So I think some of that really stopped me. Um, it, there would be a certain feeling of, I can't do this. It wasn't the law so much. It was more, this wasn't right. This was a certain, I had a certain moral fiber in me to know what I could or couldn't do. And this was, I think, a higher power. I believe God, I believe God kept me alive. So I do believe that that was one thing. I also believe that I had the, the um, aptitude to be very successful in life, whether it was with women or money or, you know, just doing my own fighting. I didn't really need to rely on anybody else for those things. So as you spend time with, you know, organized crime guys or I was with the Irish crew also you start realizing you know if you think if you're a thinker you start seeing well, what is it where are we going here where is this going like what's the end game so I was able to see some of the end game before I had to get before I got over in over my head if and we're gonna, uh, look we're going to talk about some examples of that so and then we're going to come back and we're going to keep coming back Jim into Give the audience more about how you've got over these things. Uh, Jimmy Burke, of course, you know, he was portrayed. Uh, Robert De Niro played him in Goodfellas, right? Yes. You knew the Burke. You know, you knew, his, you knew his son. Tell us about them. Give us a story about them. What was they really like? Well, I mean, I never met Jimmy Burke. Um, I met Frankie a bunch of times, his son. And, of course, I knew his, his daughter um, as, a, as, a, as a person. They were very nice. Frankie was uh, um, a wild kid, you know, but a good kid. I mean, he got high. He did things that were, you know, that the average kid obviously is not going to do. But, um, you know, I, I saw a lot of good in people. I saw a lot of good in Frankie. Unfortunately, you know, between the coke, the coke and the uh, environment, he just got caught up in that web. And of course, he winds up getting killed, shot in the head um, later on, frankly. Um, you know, I look at these guys, Steve, and I could see that, that a lot of these guys could have gone either way, just given the environment, given the circumstances. They could have done something different. But um, sometimes it's hard to dig yourself out of what you only know. You know, if you're. Yeah, a risk if, absolutely. Let's give some other examples here now on the back of that and really go for it. Yeah. You had some. So tell us about some of the other guys. Uh, your brother was involved with a lot of guys. Sammy the Bull right. Cravon. What do you think about these guys now? People like the guys. Uh, tell us about your brother's um, relationship with the guys, you know, and how that affected you, Jim. Well, I think that his original relationship with me is, 
when I got over anorexia, I went right. So I met this guy, Billy Streamer, who I used to box with. Very tough guy. And I played football with him. I was in the All-Stars with. And um, he was with Jimmy Burke and those guys at the time. He was about 21. And he was about like a year older than me. And we grew up together. And so what happened was, while I was anorexic, he came over to my house. He saw me. Couldn't believe it. Could not believe what he saw because I was emaciated. I was literally 102 pounds. So uh, to give you an example, I'm like, what, 170. So um, you can imagine 102 pounds was. I don't know if you can imagine. Um, and Billy came in and saw me, and he says, wow. I, I mean, he was blown out, and he wanted to take me to dinner, so I went to dinner with him. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I lost your question, Stephen. Please come back to the question again. Um, no, yeah, that's fine. About um, how uh, your brother's John's um, association yeah. with Gotti, uh, John Gotti Senior, John Gotti Junior. How did that affect you, Jimmy? It, so as soon as coming out of anorexia, I, I, I went with Billy, and I started getting involved with my brother, and. Of course, I'm gaining weight and I'm getting involved with my brother. And, and then I meet John Gotti Jr. And eventually I meet Senior at his house and um, at a house party, a couple house parties. Um, it affected me because it, it, it started, it pointed the arrow to where I was going. It pointed the compass to me getting involved in, in some kind of organized crime. Where before I didn't know what I was going to do. Now my, my compass was set. Now, that guy, Billy Streamer, who was with Jimmy Burke, was actually killed and shot up in, in a dump and, and found in a dumpster, I would say, about four months, five months into me hanging out with him and him taking me to dinner. So at that point, he's dead. And I already have my compass set to be, in, to be around organized crime. And whatever capacity that is, I didn't really, really intellectualize at that time. but. So I was hanging out with John Gotti, uh, my brother, those guys. And I was also hanging out with the Irish crew, Johnny Gebert, and those guys. So I had my foot with the Italians, and I had one foot with the Irish. And I was friends with everybody. I was, I was you know, but, you know, it put me in this situation where I had to grow up very fast. Because when you're anorexic for two years... You, that your emotions are stunted for two years in your life. So you're like, you're almost like trying to restart your life again. So you got, it's almost like you, you start a new life and to start that new life in organized crime is very uh, taxing on you emotionally, you know, mentally. It's, it's, you know, to go from the, you know, from a very quiet, you know, secluded kind of existence to jump into organized crime. You can imagine it, it's it's a major, major step. Yeah, anyway. we're going we're gonna to come in now with, you know, there's been some photos there, you know, some content, you know, to give the viewers some, some, some kind of understanding of the people we're talking about. You know, we're going to put some videos in here now of um, some of the current stuff of John Gotti. Right. So, coming back, Jimmy, you know, we've spoke about how you've migrated again, obviously, into really serious organized crime, around all the, 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 the neighborhood mobsters of the day. Right? Your friend, you've only been with him now, you know, for five months. He ends up dead in a dumpster. How does that make you feel? Nothing. I felt very bad. I cried for him, but it didn't stop any of my train of thought that I was going to be involved. So it didn't wake me up, no. So you would think it would have the opposite effect where I would say like, wow, look what happened to him. Let me wake up. Let me get away from this stuff. But it didn't have that effect at all. So you felt, nothing. Like, you felt nothing? I felt something for him. I didn't feel anything, any fear for myself. People would say, wow, you know, this is someone who you know, been to dinner with. He ends up dead in a dumpster, but you don't right. feel anything. Now, we've gone over, you know, we've gone over 
uh, painted the picture of your upbringing. There's a lot of um, content in there in part one of the journey. But asking right. the question, what would you say to them people that you felt nothing at that time? Well, I, the thing is, I, I did not feel anything. I felt, you know, I cried for him. And I, and I was very upset that he died, of course. So there was a lot of love that I felt, you know, when he when he when I heard. And um but at the same time it wasn't gonna stop my direction of going straight ahead into that life. So the fact that I cried for him and cared about him is one thing, but the fact that was it gonna change my my road, was it gonna take me down a different road? Not at that time, no. At that time I was yeah, this is the this is the point, Jimmy. That people who wouldn't understand the life, they would say, "Wow, I pack my stuff up and I run as far away as I could." So this right. is, you know, to help them understand what the drivers actually are and what was going on inside you at that point. That why wouldn't you see reason? Why wouldn't right. something in your face like that be enough to say, you know what? Thanks, but no thanks. Because this is an important point, Jim. Could you uh, give us an example of why you didn't feel and persisted on such a dangerous journey forward? Yeah. I think, you know, a little bit is, um, you know, sophomoric on my part. You know, a little bit, um, you know, can't happen to me. It's not going to happen to me. I mean, you know, no one thinks, no one thinks it's going to happen to them. Believe me, no one that's in the life thinks yeah. it's going to happen to them. Somebody yeah. else, it's going to happen to. Them. But I think more than that, it's like, it's like when you have your mind set, and you're and you're kind of like, you're looking to make money in the life. You're looking to, the life is already glamorized to you to a certain extent, and you you're just excuse my French, balls to the wall. You just, that's it. This is where you're going. And you're not going to let any setbacks stop you. And that was the kind of mentality I had. It was a very uh, focused, very, you know, sort of like no pain, no gain. This is the life and it's dangerous, but there was also an adrenaline rush with the, with the life, which I liked. It was a, that, that push of adrenaline. But it was more so that, Nothing's going to stop me. Like, I'm not going to be stopped by anything. I'm, I'm going to make it. But they're not coming from the same perspective that I'm coming from at that time. It's like any other thing. It's like being a football player. I'm watching a football player or box. I box. It's like watching a boxer die in the ring and say, well, I'm not going to box anymore. Ooh, that just wasn't an option. You just get yeah. in there and you fight. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of the blinkers on. You're there's a buzz in there, I'm guessing. You have all the peer pressure or the programming of the environment and your family that's in you. Yeah. That this is how you look at the world. This is how we deal with things. This is just a part of life. You know that people die and all this, all this kind of kind of stuff, and we just move on, right? So that right. is kind of dehumanized, you know. And that's what I'm trying to get to, Jimmy. To to right. to you know, to help people understand who wouldn't understand that life of what actually happens. So this is valuable. But you went a different way. Now, we're going to talk about some other big names as long as we come out of the end here. But you went a right. different way. What made you go a different way, Jim, and not keep going? Experience. You know, you start experiencing things. And you start, hopefully, you start growing. You know, when you're a teenager, you drink, you drink beer, and you drink it in the schoolyard. And then when you get to be a certain age and you get into the bars, you go to the bars and you do things. And, you know, you grow in life. You grow to the next level. And for me, it was – I started, started getting – realizing that the life didn't offer what I expected it to offer. And what endeavor it did offer was short-term. In other words – the life was good for me at a certain age because I was just coming out. It was a just coming out stage of my life. Remember, I was anorexic. 
So this life offered quick excitement, quick money, quick women, you know, quick things that I didn't know that I can do on my own. Right? I didn't have the time to cognize, you know, be cognizant uh, to to realize or to figure out that I had the ability to use my own skills to get all these things. I didn't need anything. I didn't need a crutch. Right? I didn't need a, a big daddy who was the godfather, you know, figure, the mafia figure, to be part of my journey. I could do this shit on my own without them. And so what happened was, and I saw all the negatives, now the deaths, now the, the cutthroat parts, now all the... Um, the treachery. The treachery. Well, the red flags were sh showing up now, yeah. right? And, you know, you choose to not see red flags or you just don't want to see red flags or, or maybe you're just not smart enough to see red flags. But then when you start seeing them over and over again, you say, wait a minute, where is this going to lead me in a year or two years or three years? Where, you know, where is this going? I can do this myself. I can make money without them. You know, I can, I can get, you know... You know, I love beautiful women. I can get them without them. I can I can make money and, and fight without. I don't need these extra. I don't need these props. I don't need them to get what I need. So what was your break? What was your break, Jimmy? You know, you ended up a CEO. I know you've done really cool stuff in business. What was your break to get you out of the life? I think that um, there was a few things. It's not usually one thing. It's usually a couple things that happen. That I think that the biggest thing for me that that was a driving force, Steve, was that I really did have this faith in God. And so that faith in God always kept me from doing the bad things. And in order for me to really do things that I to make money in that business, you really had to you had to have both feet in. And I had one foot in. I wasn't willing to hurt anybody for the wrong reasons. I wasn't willing to kill anybody. I wasn't willing to step on toes of, of people for no reason. So I think that my faith in God was a big factor. The other, was it one thing? No, I think it was several things that occurred where I kept realizing that God's more important than these things. And then so you, had, that, you had a moral compass, Jim. Without a doubt. I had a very strong moral compass. moral compass, right? Yeah. So now, yeah. look, you know, so you're battling other things. Tell us about some of the other challenges, like with your illness and stuff like that. How is this compounding your life as you're trying to navigate your own problems within this crazy environment? Well, I mean, it's funny that, you know, that I was anorexic and everything. What happened was I had this syndrome at, an, at a very young age. I had disordered anema. I had chronic fatigue immune syndrome, uh, Sobrin syndrome, uh, small fiber neuropathy, mast cell activation syndrome. So I had all these problems with my oxygen and breathing, and I would gain and lose weight at the drop of a dime. And I didn't know what the hell was going on with my body. So when I get involved in this uh, mafia stuff, I'm gaining and losing weight like crazy. And I think the challenges for me in sports and in, in everything else is that as I'm getting involved in these very aggressive, very tough to live and to, and to survive areas of life, I'm also challenged by a, a crazy disease, crazy diseases that are really keeping me at bay. And how I was able to navigate in sports and cheat and be able to box and do other things just is beyond my imagination how I was able to do it because I literally would fight sometimes, Stephen, with no wind capacity at all. I had no oxygen. There's a problem with us with oxygen, so we're oxygen deprived. So you can't do anything without gas in the tank. And so um, it, was, it was challenging, but what kept me going was my faith in God and what kept me going was that will to succeed, to not fail. So that, that positive spirit to keep fighting, no pain, no gain. And I knew I was sick, but I didn't, want to, but I didn't deal with it in, with a doctor because the doctor couldn't help me. 
So it was just that will, Steve. It was that, that incredible will to overcome. This is great, you know, and this will, it was translated throughout your family later on. You know, I mean, in your brother's life, John, you know, he's a media figure. You know, he's been on Netflix. He's been on many, many other TV programs. You know, his story is international. It's all over the world. Right. About the mafia, you know, about, you know, being an enforcer, you know, a mob killer, um, very aligned to the Gotti family. There's a lot of controversy about that. You know, we're going to cover that quickly because it's part of the story. And But he got out, you know, he navigated his life. He went to Brazil and stuff, you know, things like that. He was in prison for a long time. He cooperated, you know, in the life, you know, because he saw the life was coming to an end and the treachery within the life, it, he saw through it. He didn't, he saw, it wasn't what he thought it was in the end, right? As it was destroying him and everyone else around him, right? You know, and the, you know, the mafia and the New York La Costa Nostra families, then they was on the way down because of the RICO Act and, you know, the five bosses was uh, indicted. And so the historic mafia of them days was was changing. It was transitioning. So if we take it to the day, you know, to now days, to where we are now, Jimmy, um, what do you think about, we got figures like Michael Francis out there, another media figure. What do you think about Michael and... Uh, his relationship to your brother John, for instance. You know, Michael's a, um, obviously Michael's been in the media for many, many years. Uh, was a, his father, Sonny, was a big gangster. Um, Michael got his, you know, button from, from being a, a Francis. Um, Michael's a good guy. I mean, he's a, he's a businessman. He's, he, you know, I wouldn't say he's a gangster. He's more of a businessman. Um, he's a smart guy. He knows how to get around in business. And, um, you know, his relationship with my brother is they're, they're, I guess you would call friendly. There's not a uh, overt relationship. They're not good friends, but they're friendly and they, um, there's probably a, uh, a passive respect for each other, I would say. Um, I know Michael a little bit better than my brother. I'm a little closer to Michael. so Michael, you know, of course, his, his father, Sonny, he, he was a, a historic, historic gangster. Uh, you know, I, I know Michael. We've talked to Michael, you know, on the right. Stephen King and Crime Files. I've interviewed Michael. Um, uh, Sammy the Bull is another guy who's very, very prominent. Of course, he, you know, he was in die for 19 murders. You know, he was the underboss to John Goy. You know, this was the time of the, well, probably the most historic mafia killing outside uh, Spark Steakhouse in Manhattan when Paul Castellano right. was, was yeah, uh, right. assassinated with Tommy Bellotti. So there's a lot about Sammy the Bull at the moment. What was the relationship with you guys and your brother John with uh, Salvatore the Bull Gravano? Well, I mean, I didn't have a relationship with Sammy. I didn't know Sammy. I don't know exactly what my brother's relationship with Sammy was, to be honest with you. But, uh, you know, I talked to Sammy now. I, I did talk to Sammy. Um, we had a little falling out recently. But... Um, you know, Sammy is, um, he's a complicated guy. I mean, he, he did a lot of things and then he turned state, turns, turned witness. And, um, he hurt a lot of people. Um, whether he did personally or he ordered the hits, um, he hurt a lot of people. I think Sammy's got, um, Sammy's got a lot of accounting to do. You know, he's got a lot to account for. The reason why I say that is because he's been back and forth and back and forth. So, you know, hopefully he's learned his lesson at this point in his life with great peace. But he had a couple opportunities and he kept coming back into the into the life or dabbling back in, you know, 
whether it was, you know, the drugs that he get dabbled back in when he was in uh, in the Witsec program. Um, you know, I guess right now he seems like he's got his head on a little bit better and he's trying to just do entertainment and media for people. Um, he did um, he did make a deal with me and uh, he didn't follow through with the deal. So, you know, can I say he's he's still up to the same old ways? I don't really know. Uh, I don't like when someone gives you their word to do something and they don't follow through. They don't give you a word. It's one thing. When they give you a word that this we're going to do this, it's a handshake agreement. I expect that word to be followed up with a, with a with an action. So in that sense, Sammy hasn't followed up with me, um, which is not going to happen, obviously, at this point. But um, you know, Sammy's got a lot to account for, and he's got to talk to his own maker with that. I can't judge him on that, but God's got to judge him, and he's got to judge himself. So here's a question. There's a few questions now. We're going to get right down to it, um, Jimmy. You know, thanks, thanks, thanks for all your uh, explanations. You know, painting what what the life was really like for you and how that affected not just you, your brother, everyone around you, and other people, the public outside of of this life, right? So right. who do you think was the most dangerous guy? We've just named some very prominent media figures who do you think was the most dangerous you ever met jim um i think john Gotti senior was dangerous but i think john Gotti senior um had a you know people don't understand this but i think john Gotti john, john Gotti senior had a heart in fact i think john Gotti jr had a heart too so um but you could be dangerous and have a heart, right? I mean, you can have a heart and say, I'm not going to kill this guy because such and such. And I think John Gotti Sr. was that type of guy that could kill you, would kill you very easily. But at the same time, I think he had a heart and saw things a little differently. Like, you could look at guys like Tommy Karate and, uh, you know, Gas Pipe, and you could say those guys were very dangerous because they had no moral compass at all. They were sort of Sociopaths, like, and, Sociopaths uh, Jimmy. They Sociopaths. had no they moral serial, compass. They were serial killers. I think John Gotti... Yeah, serial killers. killers, yeah. Yeah, I don't think John Gotti was like that. I, I still don't think. Now, was he the most dangerous guy? Probably the most dangerous guy, because he was the most powerful guy. So, yes, he would definitely be the most dangerous guy. But was he... A, uh, a guy that would go out and kill uh, for, you know, I, I don't think so. This is not the impression I have of John Gotti Sr. So he would be the most dangerous guy in terms of power, but I don't think, again, I think he had a heart. Um, okay. Here's, here's the thing, uh, Jim. Having lived this life and the trauma and the fallout and the murder, and the pain of it all, and the imprisonment with your brother, right, and the ups and the downs. What do you say about this life now? Oh, this life is, I mean, it's its its a wasted life. It's a waste. I lost so many friends at such young ages, and the, the other friends are in jail forever. Or, But mostly I lost a lot of people very young, a lot of very good friends. They were killed by, you know, their friends. They were, these guys are killed by their friends. So the, the thing is, it is a treacherous life. It is a dirty life. Um, it's not a life for anybody that has any kind of, uh, you know, if you have any faith in God, if you have any moral compass, it's definitely not a life for you. And honestly, it's not a life for you if you're looking to have a, uh, any kind of growth and you want to become past, you know, 35 years old. You know, you can't live that life. Did so in a, life, in a life, Jimmy, where you were trained, positioned, engineered, groomed to kill your friends, what is the way to stop these things happening again? What is the way to change history so these things don't happen again and people can have different choices? I think that a lot of this starts at the, uh, 
at the very young ages. And I think it also, you know, the way your parental upbringing, I think doing things like my brother's doing is talking to people that were in the life and lived the life and telling people before they get in it, listen, this life is not what it's cracked up to be. It's not the glamour you're looking at. It's sitting in a club. It's planning murders. It's not, it's not, you know, the, the, the money, the girls that you're thinking. It's really not. The guy on top gets that. The rest of you guys are just worker bees. So it's not the life. I think you need to get them from different angles. I think it starts with the family. And then hopefully they have a good role model like my brother or, or myself or somebody else that can teach them the ropes and tell them, hey, listen, this life is not what it's cracked up to be. If you're looking for a really good life, this is not the right place to go. So I think uh, the more the more you can uh, soak new information into a kid's head, uh, I think the better off he is in learning, uh, obviously, not to fall into this trap. In the Stephen Gillen Crime Files, we take people on a real expose, a journey behind the curtain to the humanness of how this stuff really works, to the changes and to the to the darkness, but hopefully how we can navigate away from the darkness towards solution and towards the light. We're always seeking the truth and only the real truth so we can better ask the right questions and receive more enlightened, better answers going forward. This is a real privilege and it to, to, to shine the light so that others may have better choices, Jim. Our last question is, in a world where you've grown up in the mafia and they, they, you know, you've lost so many friends and you're at a pivotal point in your life now, nostalgically looking back, what is the one thing that you would change the most? You know, obviously the first thing that I would change, I mean, I believe that everyone gets to where they are based on their experiences. And I believe a lot of this is, um, you know, a lot of these experiences we have to go through to grow and to, and to move to our next level in life. So we face these challenges, whether they're challenges that we choose or challenges that are set upon us. Um, so I don't believe in, in regret, but I do think that if I can change anything, um, you know, I would certainly change getting involved in this life at all because um, it doesn't lead to anything good. There's no, there's nothing that I could say that brings about anything good by being in this life. There's not one good thing I could say about it. The only thing I could say is that if that if the opportunity came about, um, there's so many other opportunities in life. There's so many other ways to live your life. Uh, helping people and helping yourself that this is just not the road to go down for anyone that wants any kind of quality life. Jimmy uh, Aloy, I would like to thank you for inviting us into your life, into your uh, family life, your, your brother John's life. How was for you growing up the real truth about what it's like to grow up uh, in a mafia environment? in New York, what them drivers are and what the trauma is to live a life like that. And, you know, for your expose on the real truth behind the curtain. Thanks for coming on, Jimmy. Thank you very much, Stephen. I wish you the best with your new program and new shows. And it's been my pleasure. Thank you for, for having me.